All right. Good we, morning. We did it. Yeah, we're here. All the buttons work. What's up, guys? Uh, I'm Chris, and uh, this is Patrick. Uh, we're from Venture Church in Wilmington, and uh, because of the COVID-19 thing, uh, you have a unique opportunity this morning, which is you can scroll through your Facebook feed, and you can go to church at 150 different churches in North Carolina, because yeah. we're all doing it. Uh, so if you get bored in here, just you know, go hang out with somebody else. That's fine. Uh, I brought my hand sanitizer, because... Uh, Precautions. So we want to get rolling this morning with a couple of announcements, and then we want to really honor your time today and get into some teaching. Typically, we do some other things, worship and uh, communion together. Yeah. I do encourage you to do those things uh, if you're with some community today. Uh, we were just listening to a band called Kinetic Worship, which is out of uh, Concord, North Carolina, yeah. outside of Charlotte. Good friends of ours, and so go go crank up some Kinetic Worship. The Art of Love album is my favorite. Uh, and maybe, I like Universe, yeah, because that was the first I'd heard from them. Yeah, that's good. And I get I get into it. And uh, maybe share some communion with your family or some uh, people uh, that you're in the neighborhood with. Uh, but we're going to be do some teaching this morning. I've got a couple of announcements to knock out, and then we're going to get into some teaching today. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you this: we have a bowling weekend planned. Uh, we don't know if we're having that. Okay, so it's going to be on the 28th. Just stay posted. Stay tuned. We don't know. Uh, the second one, though, is really exciting. Uh, the second one is the Venture Men's Retreat that is going to be happening in May. Get excited about that, guys, because this is a chance for us to go meet with some other churches uh, and their men and go out to camp and do some manly things. I, I don't know what else on the docket for this year, but I know we're going to absolutely do the manliest thing you can do which is study the Bible and yeah. be close with other Christian men. Yeah. So that's very exciting, and uh, I look forward to doing that with you guys. You can go sign up at jointheventure.com slash men's retreat. Nailed it. Thank you. Thank you. And the last thing is this. Uh, we've been talking for several months now about a wonderful woman in Bergal named uh, Miss Margaret Wilson. Uh, Margaret had her house completely flooded during Hurricane Florence, and... Um, over the roof. And so lots of great organizations have been plugging in to help them get yeah. get her put back together. Well, look, yesterday we had a ribbon cutting ceremony. Yes. We moved Miss Margaret in. Uh, this was the home venture church that you adopted and got all kinds of stuff together to put in her home. I saw a lot of that stuff hanging on the walls and sitting on tables. Thank you for all the love that you've poured out into her. You can learn her whole story at jointheventure.com slash welcome home. They're all on our homepage as well. Yeah. Um, but that's a big celebration. Absolutely. Uh, I'd love to get us rolling with a prayer this morning, and then we're going to get into today's teaching. So uh, if you just join me in prayer. Father God, this is a unique time uh, to be sitting behind a camera and talking to my church family and uh, sharing the Word of God and dealing with what's going on in our country right now. Uh, Father, what I pray for is uh, a quick relief to this, this uh, season, that we can just have uh, normalcy back very soon and that we can continue to give you the glory through it all. And that most of all will shine light in all the dark places so that you will be known. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Sacred. We're in a teaching series right now called Sacred, yeah. Living a Set-Apart Life. And uh, getting going with it this morning, uh, it makes me think about some things we got going on in our country Absolutely. this year. Why wouldn't it not? It wouldn't. It should. Uh, every four years in our country, we do something very unique. Two things. Very unique. Okay. Uh, the first thing is, you know this, every four years in the summer. The Olympics. The Olympics. Absolutely. We have the Olympics. And the Olympics is a weird time because we, we seriously, like, we, we gather around the TV and we watch sports that we didn't know existed before the Olympics. Like, you know, I think I might get into that, you know, or, or we get into sports that we heard about, but we're like, 
I think I'd like to be a javelin thrower. Yeah, or like the dodecathlon. Yeah, that one. <laughs> <laughs> and we get into it, and, every, and this is the thing that I love about the Olympics. It's a unifying thing. We get together, we, uh, you know, we, 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 we rally around our flag. The red, white, and blue is everywhere, everywhere. <laughs> he just has that. Um, and we have national pride. It's a good thing. Then we fast forward to November. And in November, see if you can guess what this one is. Okay, okay, okay. we uh, every four years we it's a time of mudslinging and name calling, uh-huh. uh, a lot of division, argument, people trying to win. It's the uh, Venture Church Brownie Throwdown and Chili Cookoff. <laughs> yeah, no, that's in October. Oh, that's right. That's in October. No, this, uh, right, no, right. it's the Olympics. It's the Olympics. It's oh, the, uh, no, the the election. The election. Yeah, presidential yes. elections. Uh, and you know, it's interesting how much our country can be divided over the elections. Pick a party, pick a, a color, and it's two or three ways divided about the whole country. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. Uh, there are unique things, not just uh, about. It's not unique about our nation, but it's interesting about each nation how we all rally around certain points. Right. Yeah. You know, things when you go to other countries. You experience a little bit of culture shock. You get to a point where you don't always understand the culture. So, uh, several years ago, this is almost twenty years ago, uh, I got to go to West Africa, to uh, Ghana, That's and I spent cool. two months there with some of my best friends from college. We did missionary work, and it was cool because when I got there, we spent so long there. We're living in mud huts for a period of time. For the majority of the time, we stayed with a missionary host family, and it was it was just like the best. But the culture shock there for us was real. I was like yeah. 20 years old, and I am I remember I was standing with my friend Steven that I just met. He's a Ghanaian guy. Okay. I had my ears pierced because I was cool. And I uh, was talking to him, and he's like, hey, Chris, I just want to talk to you about your earrings. I'm like, okay, cool. He's like, yeah, me and some of the guys are talking, and we think maybe you should take them out if you're going to be here like a missionary. I'm like, okay, yeah, why? He goes, well, because, I mean, for us, like, when you got your earrings in like that, it's like you're like a, a gangster, like a like a mob guy, like you're like you're a criminal. <laughs> I was like, oh, sorry. So I took those things out, and then he immediately, you know, flipped the tables on me by doing something else I didn't expect. He uh, he then reached down and grabbed my hand and interlocked fingers with me, and we began to walk down the road. And I was like, we don't do that where I come from. No, uh, it's not. No. It's not part of my I, culture. I, I've known you a long time, <laughs> and I can count on my hand how many times we've interlocked fingers. Yes. So, and it was always as a joke. So five times. Yes. Yes. So uh, we, but it was strange because, and I didn't understand that that was. He's like among our friends. That's what we do. So, um, when you go to a different culture, you're going to experience different things. Now, as we're in this concept of sacred, what does it mean to be sacred? To be a set apart. People, yeah. when you look in the Bible and you see people who are living for God, yeah, what you see is a people who are set apart. In fact, the word that is often used is that they are holy people. So we use the word holy, we use the word sacred almost interchangeably for this series. There is a little bit of difference between the two. Yeah. And so to get there today, what I want to do is this. First of all, I want to get you to grab a Bible. If you've got a Bible, go ahead and grab it. We're going to be primarily in the book of First Peter today, and we're going to be studying uh, some in chapter 1, some in chapter 2. So grab your Bible, open up to those things. First Peter is a book that was written by uh, the Apostle Peter, and it was in a time of, of really, it was a hard time for the church. Yeah. And these believers are going through some persecution. Uh you know, very different from what we're having to deal with with coronavirus or anything, but the idea that, you know, there's a big thing going on in their world right, yeah. and they had to respond to it in, in like in like kind. And so we're going to be in First Peter and see how can we understand what does it mean for us to kind of have this culture, almost like a nationalism, that comes around being a believer in Jesus. And okay. so uh, Patrick's going to read that. We're going to be in First Peter starting in chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at His coming. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as He who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Since you call on a Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. There are two big ideas that we want to jump into with this initial passage, and, and you see them right there. First of all, the concept is, be holy as I am holy, and then the question of, what does it mean to live as foreigners in this world? Two big ideas, yeah, but absolutely. they really tie together the idea of living a sacred, set-apart life, and uh, what does it mean to kind of uh, seek uh, God's holiness? Really big deal. First of all, the holy as I am holy thing, when I think about that, that seems like a pretty impossible task. It does. God says, be holy. And I think about God's holiness, it's 
it's it's it's set apart. It's completely different, and it's the reason why I can't really be in His presence because He is holy. Yeah. My sin. Um, but Patrick, you're a dad. You're a dad like many times over. Yes, I've got a lot of children. You have a whole passel. Yes. Now, uh, sometimes you'll ask your kids to go like clean their room. Absolutely. Right. Do, you ask them that. What is one thing that you believe about them when you ask them to, to do that? Um, I think the the biggest thing is that they, they are capable of doing the things that I've asked them to do. Right. You you believe. Like, I'm not asking you for something that's impossible. Right. Yeah. Um, and so you're a good father. Jesus compares Thank you. God. Yes, yeah, you are. <laughs> you're a good, good father. Uh, Jesus compares uh, his love for us, right? The, and he does this, I think, it's in the book of Matthew, with with our love for our children. And he's like, listen, if if you're able to love your children, right? Don't you think that your heavenly Father would be able to love you in the right way? And in asking us to be holy as He is holy, the question is: Is He asking us to do something that's impossible? It's a deep question. I think that it really helps to understand the word holy because there is this essence of the word holy that means pure, without sin, without blemish. Right. But then there's also this nuance of holiness, which means something that has been set apart. Oh, yeah. I remember uh, when I was a youth minister in Washington, I did a, a whole series called Holiest Set Apart Batman, like the old, <laughs> right. uh, like the old Robin thing. Pow, holy means set apart Batman. Right. It was awesome. <laughs> It was fantastic. I had <laughs> Levi dressed up as uh, Robin for it. I, you guys don't know Levi, but it's funny. I'm glad there's no pictures of that. <laughs> um, and and this concept that we need to be set apart. Now, if we want to, if we want to really honor God, what God says for us is like, here, you want to be holy as I am holy. I want you to set yourself apart, the way that I am set apart. I want you to be different as I am different. Yeah. And to do that, you need to adopt some different customs some different culture. So it goes directly into this this second passage here. Since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your life, your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Foreigners. Other translations of the Bible use a really interesting word, aliens. There's also yeah. the idea of strangers. Yeah. You are foreigners. You're outsiders. Um, and so I, I think about, like, we're in North Carolina. We're in Wilmington. Okay. Okay, there's normal cities. Right. And then there's Asheville. <laughs> you guys been to Asheville? Show some love to Asheville. I love Asheville. Beautiful city. But in terms of culture, they have a they have a, a, a like a low, like a motto and it's keep Asheville weird. Okay. And their whole goal that is just sense. like they're they're super artsy, they're super My dad was in Asheville once and he said he was riding his bike uh, in Asheville and he looked over at, as he was sitting at a stop sign and there was a guy standing on the corner okay. and the guy I believe he had his head shaved except for a mohawk that was in a ponytail. He was wearing an American flag as a cape. Okay. He was wearing a kilt and boots, and he had walking on a leash a goat. Oh, he's wearing little John Lennon glasses. So okay. he looks over at my dad like, so My dad's like, <laughs> this is normal. This yeah, is fine. <laughs> this, is, this is just how life goes. What does it mean to live as aliens and strangers, foreigners in this world? It means yeah. that when people look into our lives, they're like, that's different. Yeah. That's different. That's how I would. Uh, that's the way you raise your kids is different. The way you act at work is different. The way you manage business is different. The words that come out of your mouth is, it's different. It's right. set apart. Does that achieve the holiness and the purity that is God? You know, not quite, but it helps us achieve that because through Jesus yeah. we can we can get there. So I want I want to keep going in our scripture today, uh, and I want to look at this passage from Philippians chapter three verse seventeen because the apostle Paul kind of. Hits on the same idea. So, Patrick, if you'll read that. This is in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17. Uh, Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so it's our goal to have this this citizenship, the, 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 to be uh, like like members of the nationality that is God's kingdom. That's our nation. So we're going to keep on rolling in uh, in First Peter now. So if you had that open earlier... Uh, Patrick, if you'll, you'll just read uh, verses 22, 23. We're kind of skipping a rock through the book of First Peter. Now we're at chapter 1, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring Word of God. So there's some teaching on what does it mean to actually be set apart. 
purifying yourself, by obeying the truth. In Christianity, we're super guilty a lot of times, especially in modern Christianity, of just being like, well, you know, I'm a Christian. But what does that mean? Like, how are you actually purifying yourself? What things are different about your life? Are you are you getting the foulness, the corruption? Are there are there shows on your Netflix feed that Netflix says based on your previous content, we think you would like this. Mm. We we should look at that and be like, oh, that's what you think of me, Netflix. <laughs> I wonder what God thinks of me. Yeah, you know, I wonder if I'm actually purifying myself by obeying the truth. Um, and this is one teaching thing online right now. You know, how can we can't get into all of that right now? We talk about it every single week. But I'd love to encourage you to go check out our podcast, uh, jointheventure.com slash podcast. And we have the rest of this teaching series where we're going over what does it mean to be set apart, to be different. And then we get into some of the, the nuts and bolts of this. All right. So we're going to look at First Peter 2, 1 through 3, and, uh, and see, like, so God's given us a mission, okay? But how do we begin that mission? How do we begin that mission? Look at that, Patrick, if you'll read it again. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 3. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, 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 sorry. I'm going to start that over. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation, now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. So I want to give us two big action items right here in the middle of this teaching that we can really work on. And I'm going to give them to you if you want to write them down, if you want to think about them. The first one is rid yourself. The second one is crave. Rid yourself and crave. Now, maybe you've done okay. one of these trend diets, you know, and, and it's like these things you got to purge out of your life. And I'm trying to go whole 30 or whatever these things are. And I got to right, get this. Yeah. I got to get stuff out. OK, because there's this uh, cleansing portion that happens. You know, I got, I got to get stuff out. and I got to start fresh. When God comes into our life, one thing He's asking us to do is like, you got to rid yourself. And there's a list of the stuff there of, of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and, and envy and slander of every kind. And the list goes on and on because yeah. Scripture is full of all kinds of things. Not because God's a stick in the mud and He wants to take away all our fun. More like, hey, there's a there's a virus going around. Right. It's called yeah. sin. And it's good for you to get that out of your life. But then He doesn't want us to be like empty. No. He doesn't want us to be empty. He wants us to fill ourselves. So then we crave. And I love this concept of, of like a, a newborn baby who's craving pure spiritual milk. If you're listening to us right now, you could be in any number of places spiritually. You, know, you might be super uh, strong spiritually. You've been a believer for decades. You might have just found our feed shoot six months from the time that we posted it and you're watching it for some reason because you're a stud and you're like, I'm just getting into this. I'm trying to understand what faith is all about. And I love that you kind of have the permission to start like a newborn baby. You can start at the very beginning. You, it's a very good place to start. You know, you can start by simply craving spiritual milk, like infant stuff. It's little things like I need to learn how to love in a world that hates. I need to learn how to be a peacemaker in a world that's full of division. I need to learn to have self-control in a world that tells me do whatever you want. This is spiritual milk. Now, if you've been at this for a long time, every now and then it's good to return to the milk to remind us of the basics. But there's other scripture that teaches we also need to crave the meat of the word. So this is actually getting our hands dirty and getting into the world and doing the stuff that we're supposed to be doing. And so like newborn babies, we need to crave pure spiritual milk. And if you've ever just been so hungry, I mean, I was starving the other day and then my wife had the greatest idea ever. She said, let's go to islands. My family loves islands. They have the best tacos. The dollar true. tacos after five o'clock. Uh, I think islands, you owe us some money now. I just did a commercial for you. Not a sponsor. Uh, yeah, not sponsor. But it could be. But yeah, I would gladly let islands sponsor us. Um, and if you have a favorite food, yeah. and you're just like, I got to have that. Mine's meatloaf. Mm. But, but like my meatloaf. meatloaf. Not everybody's meatloaf. Just your meatloaf. Patrick's meatloaf. And you start to crave that. What if we got to a point where we begin to crave God's presence in our life? Yeah. Like, I'm hungry. And like, why... And you might have this stirring in your soul right now, and it might be because you're actually hungry. You're hungry. I need to Man. do something different. Um, That'd be good. And we need to keep moving, but that's just some strong, some strong words there. Uh, well, let's just keep rolling and look at uh, verses four through five now. It says, as citizens, we have a unique role. This is the unique role we begin to take on. As you come to Him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to Him, you also 
like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. This whole concept, uh, it, there's so much in Christianity that it's helpful to know the background of, of Jewish faith. Okay, and so in, in Jewish faith, and I won't get too deep into this, we've talked about it some in previous parts of this series, but it's, it's really cool because in Jewish faith, uh, God had the foresight yeah. to set up some systems that would be uh, sort of a shadow of things to come. You know, there's, there's going to be this, this future time when all of this is going to make a whole lot more sense. And, right. and one of those things was the temple system. Okay. So we've talked some in this series about Moses and, uh, and the presence of God. And, and Moses sets up this system through God's instruction. He begins with uh, a tabernacle, which is a tent that right. they set up as their holy place to worship. And God says, listen, I'm going to create this space within this tabernacle, within this tent. We're going to call it the Holy of Holies. It's the holiest place. And, and inside this place, that's where my presence uh, is. And so if you, if you want to come in and worship me, gather around the tent and come and worship. And that is where we get this idea of kind of coming to a central right. place like at church, like things like that. Um, and there's this, there's this place. But then we, we talked about last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we hear this teaching that says, your body now is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So no longer the yeah. tabernacle, which was the tent system. The, the temple was the brick and mortar version of the tabernacle. And then Jesus comes into the world and he says, listen, I am going to set up a system whereby your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. You don't have to go to a building anymore. You don't have to go to a tent anymore. You don't have to travel to Jerusalem. Each believer is going to contain my presence. Amen. It's deep. It's right. powerful. And, and, and so with the system of the temple, there's an important role that has to be played. The priest. The priest. Yeah, absolutely. And not only is there the presence of God, but there's got to be someone to kind of administer the priestly duties. Now, a priest is someone who intercedes between God and man. Okay. And so they come and they make the sacrifice. They yeah. teach the law. They, uh, they lead the singing. They do all the stuff. Um, and in the system of Jesus, he says, listen, not only is your body the temple of the Holy Spirit, let, let's look back at our passage here. It says, you come to him, the living stones rejected by humans, but chosen by God. Now, this idea that we are the living stones is as if saying there is still a temple, but each of you are the bricks of that temple. Yeah. Like, let that settle yeah. in. You are the bricks. You're like living stones and, and you're kind of piled up on top of each other like this human pyramid. Uh, and then it says, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood. That's kind of crazy because that makes us individually the temple. Yeah. And then as we get together with the body of believers around the world that are all individually temples, we become the temple. We're corporately the temple. We're corporately the temple. Yeah. It's like templeception. <laughs> and Jesus, call, or the, the Apostle Paul calls us, we're the body of Christ. The body of Christ. So there's all Man. kinds of metaphors. Like we're the body, we're the temple, and we're the priesthood and so there's a time in which in our in our history where there had to be a priestly person that <coughs> interceded for god but yeah. god says no not anymore each one of you gets to be a priest that's why we can just pray directly to god right we yeah. can pray through anybody we can pray directly to god and if, if patrick comes to me and says listen i have a need i can also intercede for him and but you know i'll be a priest for you today you're struggling i'll be a priest for you today and when i'm struggling i can come to patrick and he can be a priest for me it's a priesthood of believers, and we get to offer these spiritual sacrifices. Yeah, It's a beautiful thing. Um, then we get into verse 9 and 10, because we have to understand, as the priest, they had to go through all these cleansing rituals. Right. They had to wash their hands. Where's my, my Purell? You know, they had, to, they had to wash their hands. They had to get themselves prepared for this. And so let's read this, verse 9 through what 10. Let's read 9 through 10. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I want you to hear this. If you have accepted Jesus, now you have received mercy. There's this thing in this passage that says you have been called out of darkness and into light. Every single week at Venture Church, we close our service. You know the phrase we use. We're going to go shine light in dark places. And the reason we can do that is because at some point without Jesus, we were in darkness. We were living in our sin and we were in darkness. But then we were, Ephesians says that, that, that he, he came down in and he lifted us up and he seated us at the right hand of the Father. It's like he comes in and he rescues us. I love what I think it's Colossians says, that he rescued us from the dominion of darkness. Like he comes into our life and he's like, let me turn on the flip on the light for you. 
and let me show you what light is. You are called out of darkness and into what? His light. His marvelous light. His wonderful light. And then we're given this, this, this like calling, this lesson we can teach. It says that you may declare the praises of him who called you. Like that becomes our role. We become the temple. Yeah. We then become the, the priesthood. What is our message? What is our sermon we preach? You know, I spend a lot of time every week like preparing like a lesson to teach, but you don't have to do that because the message is you get to declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into light. So what's your story? What did God call you out of and into? What is he calling you out of right now? It's our goal to live a set apart life. It's our goal to be a people who is a holy nation a royal priesthood, and we get all of those uh, those name tags. And so we, we keep on rolling here. And uh, Patrick, if you just wrap us up in our passage, 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Man. I urge you as foreigners and aliens. We, there's that phrase again. Uh, actually, it says in our version, exiles. Foreigners and exiles, but strangers, aliens, outsiders. That's where we started. We started out like we're Americans and wave the flag, and that's what it means, and we understand culture, and we understand what it means to kind of hold on to a certain, what is that, worldview? And, right, yeah. Yeah, you know, culture and all that. But what Jesus comes into our life and says is like, I want you to like live a different life. Abstain from that. Right. Abstain from the world that we were in before and start to live like citizens of a new kingdom. Man. And why? Well, one, because it helps us to be holy as he is holy. But two, I mean, this is verse 12. Live such a little good life among the pagans. We don't talk about pagans much anymore. Uh, right. But a pagan is someone who doesn't acknowledge God with their life. Right. I mean, that's, that's yeah. like the simplest explanation of that. You can get way deeper into it. But live such, such good lives among the people who don't acknowledge God in their life. That though they may even accuse you of doing wrong. Look, guys, the church has been, we one, the church has been guilty of wrong. Not because the church is bad and Jesus is bad and God's got, but because there have been people in the church yeah. who have misused the name of the church and misused, you know, the resources of the church and all that. But, but as an, an individual believer, that though the world may look at you and say, look, what you're doing is wrong. The way that you're uh, asking us to live a certain way, that's wrong. That though the world may accuse us of doing wrong, they then will see our good deeds. And because they see our good deeds, by the way, this is a paraphrase of something Jesus said, right? You know that they'll see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That they will see your good deeds and glorify God on the day He visits us. When I was a preschooler, um, I had a preschool teacher in my home church, Miss Pat. If you're out there, Miss Pat, I love you. You taught me something important. And Miss Ta- Pat taught me this song. I've told this story a couple times at our church before, but it's, I just can't get it out of my head. It's part of what made me. Uh, and, and it was this song we sang in, in like Sunday school, and it was like, uh, if, I should be, um, if I should be a police officer when I grow up, I'll be a Christian police officer when I grow up. If I should be a firefighter when I grow up, I'll be a Christian firefighter when I grow up. If I should be a teacher when I grow up, I'll be a Christian teacher. And no matter what I do when I grow up, I'll be a Christian first when I grow up. And I remember that getting into my head and me thinking, okay, I can do anything I want to do in this world. The question is, what is my driving, you know, my driving motivation? And I think each one of us kind of, we enter our day, we hit, we, we hit our alarm clock and we get out of bed and we start the day with like a name tag on. Hello, my name is Chris, and I am a blank. You know? What does your name tag say? I'm a teacher. I'm a business owner. I am an Uber driver. I work at a fast food restaurant. I I, I work with the government or I work in the private sector. Like, what, what, your name and what you do. But if you're in the kingdom of God, what he wants you to know is, like, above all of that, it says, I serve King Jesus, and I'm a priest in that temple, and I'm here to intercede for people so that they can know God's love. And so that when people see the deeds that I do, they give glory to their Father in heaven. So let me just ask you a couple of simple questions. Like, are you a parent? How much of your parenting is motivated by your love for Jesus? Not your desire for your kids to go to bed on time or to get good grades or to behave themselves in public or to not embarrass you, but so that at the end of the day, they will love Jesus. I have to remind myself all the time, my goal as a parent is to raise an adult 
Like, I don't need to have a perpetual child. That's a waste of all of our time, and the world is a, not a better place. <laughs> but if I can raise a godly adult eventually, then I've done something worth doing. As a business owner, maybe you're the, the you know, supervisor, you're the boss guy at your church, boss lady at your, at, at your, at your church, at your, your business. What motivates that? Is it your desire to serve God or is it your desire to make a widget or make a dollar? And that goes on down the list. Uh, Patrick, it reminds me of uh, what we're doing up in Bergal with yeah. Dart, Dart ILM. And uh, I mean, some of the people up there, uh, I hope some of you guys are watching right now, up, up, our, our friends up at White Stocking, um, because this community is going through a really rough time. Yeah, I mean, They've lost everything. Yeah, Houses flooded above the roofs. And I will never forget a conversation I had with Miss Catrillia. Uh, okay. And let me tell you about a little bit the, about this community. White Stocking community in Burgal is uh, it's, it's rural, it's out there, but it's a crossroads where like a couple dozen of the people who live right at that crossroads are like blood relatives. Okay. Okay. They're family, and they uh, and some of them are the matriarchs and patriarchs of all the younger people there. Miss Catrillia is one of those. Okay. And I think she's in her eighties. Forgive me, Miss Catrillia, if you're not in your eighties. I think I'm pretty sure she's in her eighties, and and she and her husband have, have been living in this spot for a long time. And I'm sitting with her in her FEMA trailer, and I'm asking her like. You know, what do you need? And she was like, you know, baby, take care of everybody else. You know, we want to make sure. I was like, no, but what do you need? And how can I be praying for you? And she just had this attitude, this really good attitude. Like, wow. we're going to be okay and God is good and all this stuff. And I said, okay, I just, you got to tell me. How do you have such a good attitude through all of this? Okay. What was her answer? She said, well, this isn't the first time I've been here. Oh, man. Now, here's the background on Miss Catrillia. She has lost everything more than once. Uh, wow. 20 years ago, Hurricane Floyd came through. Wiped their house. But 20 years before that, there was a fire that took her house. And three times, she has lost everything. And through all that time, across the street from her church, from her house is her, her church's building. And she said, you know what I do is I, I pray and I spend time in God's Word. And I spend time with my church family. And I realize that I've got everything I need. Wow. And there are other people who need things more than me. Now, I saw her yesterday at Miss Margaret's ribbon cutting. And... Uh, if you're a drywall person who installs drywall, I need I, I need you to go see Miss Catrillia. She needs drywall up in her house. But I asked her, I was like, so how are things at your house? And she said, well, they're still standing still. You know, we're waiting for drywall to finish. But she was there to celebrate Margaret. Man, that's a good heart. It is a good heart. And so that's what it looks like to be, like, different. Oh, man. To be a citizen in this world. To be a citizen of the kingdom of God. To say, no matter what's going on in my life, I can give glory to God because I know that he's got it and he's got me and he's not going to leave me hanging. And so with that, guys, um, that's where we are today. Yeah. You know, uh, we're in a weird time as a country. <laughs> um, you know, so the, 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 the governor mandated the, um, that we not meet in groups of a hundred. And, uh, it was a, you know, a suggestion earlier, but now it's a mandate. And so things are going to be dear, we're different and weird, but we have this opportunity now to stand out in the crowd. Yeah. Not in the crowd. We won't be in crowds. <laughs> to stand out among our friends. To stand out <laughs> among our neighbors. Um, are you going to be the person who is going to be checking on the elderly people on your street? Yeah. You know, are you going to be the person who has a good attitude? Or are you going to be the one on Facebook like, rant, 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 because I can change the world because i got a Facebook account. Like, But have a good attitude and be different. And people look at you and they go, hmm, they ain't from around here. Yeah. Would you mind praying for us? Not a bit. Let's pray. Gracious Father, I thank you so much for bringing us to this place right here, right now. Um, wherever we are, wherever we're sitting, um, as we learn about the role you have for us. I pray that through this time of oddness and through this time of chaos and through this time of uncertainty, that we can be consistent in shining your light into the dark places of this world. So you know we pray. Amen. All right. Well, that wraps up our time today. Thanks for joining us. Uh, and uh, let's do what we do. Let's go shine light in dark places.